Hello folks! So today I just wanted to do a really quick walkthrough and how you can have finer control over the colors of individual chains in molecular nodes. I'd like to note that this method is friendly even for those entries that have a lot of chains that are associated with them. Um, you do have finer control over each individual color and it's still going to be just a little bit tedious but at least everything will be placed in a smaller space so that you don't have to um, navigate a larger section over in ge geometry notes. So let's just jump into it. Navigate over to the protein data bank and select whatever entry you're interested in. In this case, I'm going to do clathrin because there's quite a few chains that I would like to distinguish from one another. Delete that default cube and put in the entry that we're interested in. This particular entry is quite large, so I'm just going to scale it down by pressing S and moving inwards towards the world origin so that it's a bit smaller and fits into the frame of our camera. Navigate on over to the Geometry Nodes tab, and we're going to add in a biological assembly node in between um, the output and our colors input. I'm going to move back over to the Shading tab and add in an HDRI so I can have some very basic um, lighting information and go on over and change the scene background so that it is transparent and speeds up the performance of my computer. Now what I'm going to show you is the default coloration of the chains, and it's alright, but if you want to have finer control over the individual colors and create a color palette to follow, you can certainly go in and individually add in a selection node and a color manual node as I'm showing on the screen right here. But as you'll note for large entries, it does become tedious and annoying quite quickly. So this method helps to cut down on time and space. So what we're going to do is count up how many chains are associated with this particular entry, which is 18 in this case. Add in a color ramp node, and we're going to add in markers to represent different parts of 18. So you're going to want to add in a 1 out of 18, then a 2 out of 18, and so on and so forth until you reach 1. Now do note that this part still is going to be a bit tedious, but it does set the base uh, color ramp node that we can do different um, additions onto later. And as you finish up this process, turn that interpolation type from linear to constant. This part is optional, but I'm going to navigate over to Coolars and pick out a predetermined um, color palette so I don't have to fumble around and figure out what colors look good with each other and what is going to be friendly for those that are colorblind. And if you've watched previous videos, you'll know that I really like Coolars because of its intuitive UI and because of its ability to check through different types of color blindness for your palettes. Now with this one, there, there is a uh, kind of conflict in between two different colors that I have in my palette, so I'm going to be wary of that type of um, distinguishing between the two later on in this tutorial. But in checking through all the other different types of color blindness, Overall, this palette seems to be okay. We're going to add in um, additional changes like saturation values to uh, distinguish, but from here I'm just going to export this palette as an image so that I can use it as a reference in Blender. So pull up that reference image that we just saved from Coolars so that we can color pick directly from it. So you're going to want to add in a mapping range node at this point, and when you do so, change the minimum value from minimum to 1 to from maximum 18 so that it maps all of our different chain numbers 1 through 18 into our um, 0 to 1 values which makes it friendly for our color ramp. At this point you're going to want to go in and just color pick those values that you have from your reference image or manually select what hex values you want to have in for each of those individual colors. Um, I use Coolars because it, it helps to quicken the amount of time that it takes for me to change these colors. So yeah, there you go. I have one extra node um, at the end, so I delete that. 
Now it looks like it doesn't do anything, but that's because previously I've copied over a color manual node twice. So as soon as I remove that from here, you'll see the actual um, connected color manual node. So just pull that into there and we have our each individual chains selected according to the color ramp values that we've assigned it to. As I zoom in, you'll notice that a lot of the initial values, like chains one through four, are all grouped up pretty closely to each other. And in this case, they're all like kind of similar shades of blue. So I want to better distinguish all of those from each other. So after I, I set up the scene a little bit more um, by changing the focal length of the camera and by changing the angle at which we're going to be looking at the clathrin, we're going to add in a couple of additional changes to our material so that we can distinguish um, a bit better from each other. So once again, we're going to navigate back on over to the shading tab and select our principal um, molecular material node. Note that the attribute that we're referring to is chain underscore number. So we're going to pull that out from geometry nodes and refer to it within the shading tab here. So add in an object attribute node and type in chain underscore number, all lowercase here. That's going to be very important that you're um, using the correct capitalization or lack thereof. Add in another color ramp. And add and connect in a mix RGB node. Connect that factor number over to the color ramp from our attributes node. And we're basically just going to repeat the entire process that we've carried out in geometry nodes. And no, I don't think you can just copy over the map range and the color ramp node directly from geometry nodes, because I tried doing that and it said that they're two different types of data. So unfortunately, at the moment, you're going to have to just um, duplicate that entire process by going in and adding in markers and uh, manually putting in their fraction values. So instead of referring over to the colors that I've selected from the reference image, I'm just going to change the saturation values here by doing every other color as being like a lighter or a darker version of itself. And I want to change that mix type over to any other different type. Um, you can select whatever you want that works with your color palette, but I think like soft light or screen tends to look better when you're um, changing the saturation values. And instead of just um, going with an every other black to gray, I'm going to add in a uh, kind of off white color as well so that I can add a little bit more visual interest as well. And here I decided on like the light blue, copying over that hex value to every other um, <clears throat> color. This first modification helps to add a difference in brightness and contrast in between every other color chain. So depending on how many chains are in your, your protein, you can just leave it at this. But if it's something like clathrin or a virus, you may want to add more um, distinction in the color types. Here I'm just going to add in a difference in hue by changing that over to mix and changing the color ramp values from like a blue to a yellow. Um, and connecting the map range that we have established earlier over to the factor value as well. Now this isn't an exact science, so just use your best discretion when trying to distinguish each of your individual chains from one another. 
at this point in the process, I'm finished with custom coloring the entry. So if you want to skip over this and just do whatever you want, go ahead. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go over to the compositing tab and just start styling what the final rendering of this is going to be like. So adding in an alpha over value, changing that background to a color that will make um, the, the subject pop. Adding in a lens distortion value because I do enjoy that um, bit of lens imperfection that we get there. And adding in a glare node to fog glow, lowering the threshold just a little bit so that it's not way too um, bloomy or overwhelming for the eye. This little bit is a, something extra that I wanted to do for this one, which is just adding a bit of a watercolor kind of texture to it. So I'm going to unsplash using a free paper texture and importing that into Blender. And I'm going to use a mixed RGB node as well to um, overlay this texture and to give it a bit more visual interest into our scene. So add in a mix RGB node and um, arrange the nodes so that the, um, the, the texture that you want is going to be at the very bottom. And I'm going to select soft light as my, my mix type here. And from there, I'm just going to mess around with my different values and just make sure that this is the final look that I want to go with. Here I'm changing the world settings so that the strength of the HDRI is not at 1. Um, I'm going to lower that down a little bit because I want to add some more contrast with a different light source. I'm going to add in an aerial light and then change its location so that it's not at the world origin. Rather, it's going to be above and slightly to the right of my subject here. In the light settings tab, I'm going to change the spread over from like 180 degrees over to one degree so that it's a more um, concentrated direct spotlight and then adjust the brightness of my light as well. And then from there, just make whatever changes looks best in this scenario here. You can certainly leave the light to be just pure white, but I prefer to add an off color to that so that it's not quite as um, jarring for me. And here we're going to edit our scene just a little bit by adding in an empty and rotate that empty 360 degrees and ensure that its interpolation type is linear so that the speed at which that it rotates is the same all throughout. Select the subject of your scene and add in an object constraint to copy the rotation of the empty that we've just added into our scene and animated. And that's the entire walkthrough. So if you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, all of that. And if I come up with a way to completely automate this process in future iterations of molecular nodes, I will definitely update this. So I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and I'll see you when I see you. Bye.